dubious honor of meeting great League of Nations dog from a territory called, happily enough, Magog, the land of God. He and uh, his uh, far away allies have taken note that there's a small country down there on the Mediterranean, just north of Egypt, that has been blessed and they have come back from their captivity and they are prospering and they are doing well and there's no fences, no walls, no fortifications. They are just out there for the taking. And we learn in chapter 38 that God's primary motive was what? Plunder or greed, yes, plunder. Oil, yeah. <clears throat> and so three other countries, Sheba, uh, Dedan, and Tarshish, three other different countries, hear about God's plans and they ask him, are you going against Israel for all of that money? Now I'll paraphrase, if you are, I'd like to join in. And I don't know what God said in reply, but he probably took them up on it. And uh, at the end of chapter 38, we have a description of God's sending disaster along God as he is seen as invading the mountains of Israel. Chapter 39 will also deal with this same person, God. And uh, the first eight verses are a restatement of what we've already heard in chapter 38 with some additional details or information added. <clears throat> Actually, uh, chapter 39 gives, goes into detail of God's defeat, which is told to us in the last part of chapter 38. And it's just God speaking to Ezekiel says, and you, son of man, prophesy, or speak my message against God, and say, thus says the Lord God, quote, I am against, behold, I am against you, O God, friends of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash your arrows from your right hand. So we know that God is right-handed. You will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all of your troops and the people who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, that's ironic, and they will know that I am the Lord. So in verse 2, he says, I'm going to my translation has turned you around. Now, we, we looked in chapter 38 and we noticed that part of this was God's plan to bring God against his people in this vision. It's a vision. And we also learned that God is happy to go along. He would like it to because he is greedy and sees in Israel easy pickings, easy money. So he's going to turning him around in verse uh, 2, that is, God is going to frustrate God's purpose in coming down and stripping Israel of everything that she has, and he's going to frustrate God's purpose, God's, to God's ruin. God, God you see, is having plans this way, God's going to turn him around and change his plans. In verse 6, notice 
that the judgment against Gog as he brings his huge army into Israel, that the destruction that we've read about in the previous chapter toward the end of it is not to be confined to the destruction of the army of God itself alone, uh, but will also extend back to God's homeland. So not only is an army just going to be destroyed upon the mountains of Israel, but God's destructive judgment is also going to destroy home, those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. Now what does that tell you? They were not expecting it. And if you had an army the size of God, you wouldn't expect it either. So they were caught completely off guard. And what is ironic, Israel is also dwelling in safety. Secure, she believes, in her position, even without the fortification or walls. She is laid open, and that is because she's no longer trusting in Egypt or Babylon or Assyria, but has finally learned to trust in God himself and doesn't bother to build these walls because they believe he will deliver them, protect them which he does. Verse uh, 7. Let's see. Let me get this here. Yeah. My holy name will I make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel, Behold, it is coming, it shall be done, declares the Lord God. This is the day, excuse me, that is the day of which I have spoken. Have we run across this idea of God's concern and jealousy for his name before in Ezekiel? It runs all through it. Yeah, he's, he's concerned about his name. Because of what the nations have come to think about him, especially since Israel went into captivity. They thought, remember, that A, either he wasn't able and came up against a stronger God and was defeated, and thus his people were taken captive in spite of his power. He was overpowered by these pagan gods, or some of them believe that he had deserted his people. But whichever approach you see, God's name is profaned or desecrated, uh, and he wants that fixed, not only because of what the nations around think of him, but what, who else? Israel. What his reputation is among his own people. And he intends by this uh, judgment that he's going to inflict against this huge army to take care of both of those problems and to secure his, and I can't think of a better word, maybe you can, of his reputation. His reputation. Any questions so far? And one of his main condemnations about the children of Israel was that they had brought and derision on him yes. in his name. Uh, what they did. Yes. In fact, they gave up their gods. They said, who, what other nation has ever given up their gods to go to what that is my God? I think, I think that's in Jeremiah 2 or 3. Uh, it's a beautiful passage. But uh, somewhere in Romans 2, Paul says, that the name of God is blasphemed because of you speaking to Jews of Paul's day. Some 550 years later, I can't find the verse, it's not right under my thumb, uh, but it is in Romans 2, oh, verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because 
also you. And so I think I've really, unfortunately, changed in the next five and a half centuries. Then, first time, then those who inhabit the cities of Israel, that is his people, will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers. By the way, that's a large shield and a small one. Bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires from the weapons that God's defeated army leaves in Israel. They will not, verse 10, they will not take wood from the field, that is, have to cut down trees, or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with those weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who despoil them, and seize the plunder of those who plunder them, declares the Lord God. Now in verse 9, something is assumed as, as already happened. What is it? Yes, God's absolute, total, complete destruction. It's right. We haven't heard about it since the end of chapter 38, but it's assumed between verse 8 and verse 9 of this chapter. So once God has decisively and forever dealt with God as a threat, then for the first time in all of this, Israel gets the call from God that, hey, I want now you to do something. They had spent their time so far doing what? Watching. Nothing. Standing on the sidelines. While God took care of them easily. She plays no part in winning the victory. She just carries out what our military leaders and generals have called the mopping up operation. That's all she's going to do. And it's going to be very profitable for them because if you take this literally, for the next seven years, she's not going to have to go out and provide any wood for anybody in the entire nation because the size of God's army was such that there was seven years' worth of firewood left on the battlefield when they were defeated. Now, folks, that's a lot of men to leave that much wood on the battlefield. They won't have to go cut any down. They'll just cart it home and use what has already been provided by God. In other words, God came there to spoil them, but it ended up that God was the one who was spoiled completely. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We learned that uh, Yahweh wants uh, no remnant left of God's army in the entire country. Because we're going to learn in the next image that the flesh of his army is going to be eaten by the birds. Now why does God want every remnant of God and his army and everything that he carried out of the land of Israel? The pollution. Exactly. He wants this land to be holy. And he, remember, calls himself holy throughout this book. And that's the way he expects his people to be and his land to be holy also. So this is one way to cleanse the land of every remnant of God and his army. Uh, it was in back in chapter 38, verse 12, speaking of the uh, uh, spoil. God is speaking in verse 11, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages, verse 12, to capture spoil, to seize plunder, uh, plunder, and to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited. And it happens just the opposite of what God was hoping for. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> okay. Verse 11. On that day, I will give God a burial ground in Israel. And we have various translations of this next phrase. Mine has the valley of those who pass by 
east of the sea, and they will block off those who would pass by. By the way, the Hebrew is not real clear here either, but to continue. So they will bury God there with all of his horde, and they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog for seven months. Here we have that same big, uh, element of time. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them, and it will be to their renown on the day when, excuse me, on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. Now, looking back at verse 11, I, I found translations of the Valley of the Travelers, Travelers Valley, Valley of the Passengers, uh, those who travel east and those who pass by east. We don't know anything about which one of these is correct, but the, it's all it's telling us is the location in the vision of where this is, huge cemetery is going to be dug and all of God's army, all of his dead, are going to be buried in this cemetery, wherever this valley of those who pass by. East of the sea, we don't even know which sea he's talking about. But I don't think it matters because it's going to take them how long to bury everybody? Seven years? And how many people are going to be engaged in the burial? Every person in Israel, every person, will be charged with helping to bury God's dead. And with every person doing that, I found out somewhere, a conservative guess would put the faith of the figure at 360 million corpses. 360 million corpses. That's I'm sorry? They would be unclean for the dead bodies for a while. Yes, they would. Yes, they would. Uh, but remember, this is a vision. This is a vision. Well, and when you come with a vision, you can do anything. You can do just about anything. Use any figure you want as long as you get the point across that you want to make. Yes, Rick? Now, I started to think about that already because he's already said that their bodies would be uh, eaten by the birds of the air and the, and the, and the animals. Mm hmm. Yes. The children are being buried. But yes, that's. Uh, the bones. I'm sorry? The bones, they're uh, the remnants after the animals are attached to everything. Yes. So yes, because. Uh, these are one thing else in one space. Uh, yeah, you can change figures even when it's not a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I just used vision. Vision. Thank you. You can change figures to a picture of defeat any way you want to, but the point is that God was overwhelmingly defeated. And this gives us a hint as to how large the army must have been. Now, in verse 12, when it says it will block off those who would pass by, the only thing I can get out of that is there would be so many corpses and so many graves that the valley will be completely filled up and blocked off to any further travelers. If you've got 360 million corpses, that might be what is referred to here, but that's just my guess at it. Uh, the Haman God, by the way, in verse 11, at the end of it, Haman God means the valley of the hordes of God, aptly named. Uh, let's see. So after Israel has plundered it, all of the weapons from them and use them for fuel for the next seven years. Uh, she will be burying corpses and not to mention 
the ritual uncleanness, the cleanness that this would bring, but also the sanitary problems that you would have with 360 million corpses, especially if it takes you seven years to bury them all. Seven. Oh, seven months. I'm sorry. Uh, so you would have, yeah, you would have a, a sanitation. But remember, this is a vision. We can we can deal with that in a vision. Uh, uh, the word in verse 13, renown, uh, one translation has that uh, uh, this will serve as a reminder of what happened there that day. Or one translation has their fame will spread or they will be honored by God's defeat brought about, brought about I'm sorry, by their God. Young lady, question. 360, well, what's the population of this country right now? <clears throat> Close to that? What's the population of the U.S.? About that. Huh? About that. About that? No? Somebody get your phone. That's how many corpses. Marking the ones that were missed the first time. 
verse uh, 17. Then the purpose of all this is to cleanse the land ritually and sanitation wise. <clears throat> As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, I want you to speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field, and this is what I want you to tell them. Assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I am going to sacrifice you as a great, as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink excuse me, blood. You will eat the flesh of my men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, by all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted, and drink blood until you are drunk, from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you, you will be glutted at my table with horses, charioteers, with mighty men, and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. <clears throat> now remember, in the previous idea, we have all of them buried. Okay? That gives us an idea of purification and how many there were. Now the picture changes to a different idea and a different picture because the bodies are seen as being laid out, open out in the field. And we've run across this image too, I believe, in Revelation. Where God, now this idea of a sacrifice could just mean a meal. Could just mean a meal. I'm serving uh, God today for lunch and everyone is invited out there. Uh, <clears throat> At my table would be at the field where Gog and all of his cohorts were killed. That is probably referred to as the mountains of Israel. So we are being told here that if Israel can win against an army like this, then they don't have anything to worry about. John. Can we go back? Oh. Oh. Excuse me. That's where we're going to go. Beginning with verse, any questions on this? So we've just changed images from burial to being eaten out in the open field. <coughs> same, what we say on the same idea. <coughs> verse 21. Can you just refer to that? Just. <coughs> I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird mine has and beast of the field, and you will fall in the open field, for it is I who have spoken. So this is just a thank you for pointing that out, a fulfillment of what the Lord had told Ezekiel earlier. Okay, Ezekiel concludes this message by summarizing the Lord's purpose for restoring Israel to their land and protecting them from this evil ruler, God. Therefore, verse 25, thus says the Lord God, I will now, with the defeat, <clears throat> uh, no, this is not after the defeat, he moves back to the present time. Now, yes ma'am. I'm skipping one. That's pretty sloppy of me, isn't it? You're just confusing me at all. <laughs> I forgot to read verse 21, so I confess, yes, I did. Okay. I don't think I've read any of that. I don't think I did. I don't think I did. I think I, I, think I just ran around. Must be something there. I don't know what must be near the end. Must be. <clears throat> and I will set my glory among the nations. And all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them, being God. 
And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile, not because I was weak and not because I was fickle or forgotten, but because of their iniquity, because they acted treacherously <coughs> against me, and I hid my face from them and sent them into exile. And I gave them into the hands of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword, according to their uncleanness, or I think I have it Yeah. And according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them for 70 years that Jeremiah predicts that they were going to be in exile. So this display of Yahweh's glory involved, in this case, the punishment of his people as righteous retribution for the way that they had lived. And I guess you could say they embarrassed him to the nations around Israel. They were an embarrassment to Yahweh because they were called to be holy people and they weren't living like that at all. Uh, so in verse 23 we learn that their exile was not because Yahweh had been defeated in some battle somewhere against the uh, pagan of God but because he was sick and tired of the sin of his people and he turned his face away from them and sent them into exile, and so this also yeah. uh, this also contrasts God's punishment as opposed to God's destruction, which He's promised. He's just promised destruction to God and make on it, and now He's chosen. I came like this against Israel, but it was a punishment. It was not in destruction. Not utter destruction. Right, he left a, uh, what we'll call a room. We're going to have to stop here. Um, all of you architects, I'm going to need some help for next week. Next Wednesday night. Oh, well. Yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out this temple plan. It's not wrong. I've got a blueprint right here. Yep. Yep. I've got one similar to this. And that's what's going to be up here. And I think it's probably the original one. Yeah, maybe. Chapter 40, 41, 42, and part of 43 are nothing but the plan of the temple that Ezekiel sees in a vision from God. So that's where we're going to be for the next three chapters. And we, we will not, I promise, get bogged down with all of the details and obscurities that are in those chapters. I promise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, work that you have sent us. And as I've often asked, that you give us understanding and insight. But most of all, Father, help us to carry it out in our lives. Bless us and help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.